My usual is my co-host Christian, who's joining us from sunny Los Angeles, California. How are you doing today, Chris? Uh, I'm doing all right. Just uh, made some tea, getting the day started. Um, yeah, unlike uh, unlike the weather by you, yeah, it's just sunny, no rain, no rain. No it's, su- it's sunny where I'm at too. I'm in Milwaukee, but uh, no time for BS right now because today we've got a very very special guest. Um, I know we I know we say that a lot, but I would say that this guest is far more special than our other guests. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I used to watch this show religiously to be able, I, when I told my mom that we were getting this guy on, she was like, like, no way. Yeah, very excited. For sure. Well, without further ado, um, this man needs no introduction, but we'll give him one anyways. He's an actor best known for his iconic portrayal of gay New Jersey mobster Beto Spatafore on the greatest television show of all time, The Sopranos. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Ganascoli. How are you doing today, Joe? Kyle, Christian, what's happening, guys? So, Kyle, you're in uh, Milwaukee. I've been there. And Christian. He's in Los uh, Angeles. He's in doing what you LA. did. He's Where in there. LA are you? I'm in, uh, I'm in Mar Vista. Mar Vista? What is yeah. that? It's like, uh, it's borders Santa Monica, uh, Venice, and like Culver City. Oh. Yeah. All right. Cause I was in West Hollywood. But uh, L.A. on a whole is a shithole. You know that, right? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's some pockets that I enjoy, but overall, like, it's, it's way too expensive to live. I mean, you got to be, yeah. You got to be, like, rich to live in L.A. and enjoy yourself, right? And I'm not rich either, so, you know. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know what West Hollywood's like, but, you know, I was downtown a couple of years ago, and I couldn't believe. I just wish the fucking homeless would go live in Beverly Hills. You know, we should be, put him on a bus. That's, that's, that's what should go. So that, that's I'm sure Rob Reiner would open up his fucking doors. <laughs> Absolutely, I don't see the problem with that. Any nothing wrong with moving him over to the gated communities. I well, think. It's but um, it's funny you say that because like I have not had one of them ever come up to me and asking me for money. They like literally, I walk down the street, and none of them talk to me. It's crazy. Well, that's it's, because you look it's, fucking hopeless yourself. <laughs> yeah, they're like this guy. This guy doesn't that's have the fucking that's the <laughs> trick. Yeah, that's the trick. It's like a costume. You put it on. You're in Hollywood. Back like a fucking homeless person. You won't get bothered. Yeah, just walk around talking to yourself. Right, so, um, all right, and uh, Milwaukee, uh, you know, good sports town. Uh, Bucks, Brewers, Packers. Yeah. And you know you're uh, a gambler. You ever won money on the Packers before? Uh, I must have. Uh, I must have. They, yeah, they didn't cover against the Patriots. Uh, no, they didn't. No, it was like nine. Oh, no, that was point. a surprise. Yeah, it was nine. Yeah, and they, they took it. Uh, I mean, who the fuck figured the you know backup quarterback the Hoya is gonna and then Zappy Bailey Zappy gonna make it a close fucking game, but. That's why I fucking sports. <laughs> I think Vegas. I think Vegas. Vegas had the end on that one. They're, yeah, it's rigged. I swear, man. It's so easy. I just the older I get, the more convinced I'm. I am that all sports are rigged. Well, well Kyle, now, you had that. Uh, Kyle, you had that with like that six team or six parlay prop bet. And, yeah, which was stupid parlay. I mean, yeah, but like, just like one guy being half a yard short to hit. I just don't understand how they come up with, like, the lines for everything. There's just some very smart people figuring all that out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can tell you how many fucking ways I lost. Uh, forget it. Uh, although the under last night was a good play for me. So that was good. Uh, Super Bowl, Mahomes, I think he had um, rushing over 29. He got it. And then in the waning moments... He's putting his knee down and he's backing up and backing taking up. a knee. And I lost fucking. I go, I covered. And they go, no, you didn't. I go look at the box score. Fucking backed up two or three yards, took a knee. Backed up two or three yards, I wound up fucking being under. 
at 29. I lost so many different ways. Don't even get me started. So he um, won some good ways too. I hope. Yeah, you know, you never, you never really fucking bang them out. I mean, they did have a parlay last night. There you go. I gotta make sure my wife doesn't see this. Oh. Fucking. Uh, <laughs> I don't show. Smoking the cigar or talking about gambling? Oh uh, no, she knows. I mean, it's hard to smoke. I mean, this car she. She knows when I'm home. The smoke, she could smell it in the house. Um, yeah, no, the, you had the Yankees winning and the uh, under. So that was a good little. But I should have banged. I mean, I had the under and the. Uh, no, I had the Yankees winning under and the, the thing, but I should have had under. But who knows? Severino's going to go throw a no hitter through seven. Do you, think judges, had, hold on. you think judges is going to get 62? Uh, well, he's got three games left. And uh, you can see he's pressing, but he's got a quarter break with nice weather in Texas. So I really want him to break it. Um, yeah, I just wish she would have went out with a bang and went on a little tear to finish with like 65, 66 right. would have been nice. But uh, now at, at this point, I mean, he'll think about it the whole winter and he'll be stuck on, on it. And I also want the fucking batting title for the Triple Crown. But fucking sitting Arias or he's sitting and then that's like a fucking douchebag move it's two douchebag moves one Arias is sitting or whoever's the leader and then two not fucking pitching to fucking judge and coming after him they're doing it in Texas but Baltimore and fucking Red Sox with two douchebag fucking moves by not pitching to him but it's all right it is what it is it is what it is well just to give you a rundown of um Again, thank you for being on our show today. Just uh, to give you a rundown of who we've had before. So we've interviewed the mayor of Milwaukee, a uh, country music singer, a pro wrestler, a former reality TV star, uh, the new head coach of the UW-Milwaukee Panthers men's basketball team, some local Milwaukee celebrities. So for you, I mean, it must be an honor knowing that you're the biggest, more, most important guest that we've ever had on our show. No pressure. Right? Well, listen, anytime I'm mentioning the same uh, breadth as the uh, – Mayor of Milwaukee. I mean, that's special for me. Exactly, for sure. So, um, you were born. Is he a woke? Is he a woke fucking mayor? I don't even know what Milwaukee is. No, no, I would say he, I mean, he ran as a Democrat, but Milwaukee, he's very, I'd say he's very middle, more like pretty close to the center. So he's big on funding the police. I mean, we got a lot of reckless drivers out here. So, no, I mean, he's mindful of, like, the social issues, but also he's big on tough on crimes. So, yeah, for a city like Milwaukee, he's good. He's not crazy left-leaning. Now, uh, so, Kyle, you were born in uh, Wisconsin? Yeah, I was born in northern Wisconsin, uh, went to college in western Wisconsin, lived in Madison for a while, which is where UW is, and I've been in Milwaukee since beginning of 2016. And Chris is from, I mean, he grew up here, too. Oh, yeah. So, so you're a Badger. Yeah, I mean, I don't really like watching the Badgers. They're pretty boring to watch. No, they're they're like hard. Basketball, football. They're hard. Definitely more of a pro sports fan. Mm. Love my Packers, okay. obviously. I know you're a uh, you're you Giants. Got the Packers this week. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Sure. Yeah. You gonna put put yeah, some money I'm, on? I'm uh, hard. What? Are you gonna put some money on the game? I'm going to look at it. I'm going to see where it's at. And uh, I think there are seven and a half favorites to Packers. Uh, this is a real test now. Although Tennessee opening up first game away, new coach, new fucking half the team is new. That was a test. So uh, I just don't want them to get blown out. I want them to play tough. And, uh, you know, we lose, we lose. I don't have it as a win. Uh, but, you know, now the easy, I don't want to say easy, but. Two out of the four fucking games we played were easy. Um, you know, the Titans were tough and the Cowboys. So we'll see where we're at with that. And, um, yeah, 9.30. It's a nice part, is it? Nine. So what time is the game on and um, where you are? 8.30? Eight thir- yeah, 8.30. That's fucked. I mean, listen, I love waking up and fucking game is on. You don't have to wait all day. Yeah, yeah I don't. Know. Chris, I pre- I Chris experiences that being out west most, for the most yeah. part, right? It's terrible. Like, I don't want to watch it pro football game at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's way too early. Oh, I do. When I fucking first got to L.A. and I was like, oh, what is it? I don't, because I hate to wait till 1 or till 4 or Sunday night, waking up, fucking go get breakfast, do what I got to do, and then go 10 o'clock game, boom, it's out of the way. I loved it. 
I just yeah, feel drunk by, by 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 the end of like four o'clock. Like I'm just drunk. Like it's not fun. Like my whole day's gone. Like the opposite way. I, I don't. What mind. do you got better to do? Hey, I'm just saying. I like to see. I like to see it in, like dark out when I'm watching football. Not you know, sun shining in my goddamn face. Move back. Yeah. Move back to the Midwest. So, uh, so Christian, you're an actor. I mean, yeah, He's both trying Tyler to be I, one like both. everyone else. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I was gonna ask hey, you have roommates for him. No, I live I live by myself actually. And so you have an agent. You're you taking classes. You in theater or you I'm going not, on auditions? I, I'm taking classes. I, I just moved out here about a month ago. Oh, a month yeah. ago. Yeah, so it's very fresh. Yeah. Well, I don't have to fucking tell you to watch your back. Don't go out at night. Oh fuck! I mean, I, you know, I tell anybody coming to New York. Don't take the fucking subways. No, I wouldn't do that. Oh, no, the subways. Don't watch your good. fucking back. I mean, because there's fucking animals running around. So, yeah, that's um, only gonna you be, you're not in the fucking country anymore. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not. But I do have a, there's a porn star in my class, which is nice. So that keeps me going back just for that, at least. She hot? Yeah. She's, she's working? Yeah, of course. <laughs> she's, I, trying to, so she's trying to become a, a legitimate actor, huh? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I guess I mean, I mean you can take acting skanky fucking skanky porn stars. I, I mean, mean they're, they're out there. You know, she's a good-looking girl. Like you know, like yeah, there's yeah. You can see. You I can give her credit for trying to that. get out of business and try. That's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, yeah, but you know, if you don't have a fucking thirteen-inch cock, she's gonna let you know. You yeah. should probably go out with you for your personality. Yeah, definitely exactly. more work for women in the business. Yeah. Well, Chris, that's always, I mean, I don't know how big yours is, but that's always, I don't know if it's, you can qualify. They're going to be casting you in porn movies. Maybe not as, not straight ones. I mean, not straight porn. you know, as a matter of fact, if you had a 13 inch cock, she would be like, so what? I've seen a million of them, but I really, you're really funny or you make me laugh or I think you're really good in class. You're a good actor or I'd like yeah. to work with you. could work, work on a scene. That might be a good way yeah. of talking too. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, the only that, Chris. It, it, It's not happening from what you guys were first saying. Yeah, so I, it would happen. Yeah, you have to you have to buddy up with her, and then she can be a scene partner. But um, so speaking of New York, Joe, so you grew up, uh, you were born and raised in Brooklyn during the '60s and '70s. What was your neighborhood like? Um, uh, well, '60s. I mean, I was a kid. I was fucking, you know, ten years old to like seventy. Um. It was a good neighborhood, Italian neighborhood called Gravesend. Um, cool name. Uh, you know, there was the mob influence in the neighborhood. There was there. There was where they hung out. You knew about them. I didn't really hang out. I didn't go, you know, stayed away. I was more into sports, playing sports. I was in the park, played hockey, you know, uh, baseball, not basketball, not football. Um, but... Yeah, I didn't hang around with those guys. But, you know, I knew they were there. And I knew people, as you got older, you started going to, like, where they were. And, you know, you knew of them. But I always stayed clear. But, you know, I did shit uh, growing up. Um, Mob-related, I guess. (laughs) Mob-related? I was going to ask you, but you've done some other interviews where you said that, yeah, you said you grew up around people that were obviously connected to the mob. Is it one of those things where you kind of figure it out on your own or putting two and two together? Or is it like people filling you in being like, don't mess with so-and-so be careful. Well, with those people, I mean, if it's someone you don't know, or you want to know to what extent, if they're just connected, which, which they know people or they're actually in the life, you know, you know, they're with somebody and they're, in the life, see, there's, there's a difference, you know? Right. Um, yeah, you don't want to fuck around with someone that's uh, in the life because, uh, you know, uh, I've seen guys uh, told to stay away from someone's wife, girlfriend, daughter, not listen, and they get killed. I've seen fucking guys that I didn't see it. I just heard, you know, in the neighborhood, fucking this guy got killed. He shot right, right off there. Taking the fucking sun with the visor like Bully Walnut used to do. Yeah. Right on the square. There was like a little square. 
They like streets and, you know, guy have benches and a couple of trees and guys would hang out, taking the sun, boom, boom, boom. Fucking, you know. So that happened in the, uh, in the neighborhood a lot. You know, guys got oh. fucking in the seventies, uh, maybe even in the eighties. Then it all started changing nineties, two thousand. Right, and I saw. Um, so you graduated from looks like Lafayette High School, yeah, uh, which is no longer a school, right? They closed. They I closed. Think, I I think it's a charter now. Okay, and um, it looks like so you went to the same high school as Sandy Koufax. That's uh, correct. Larry Larry King did your homework, huh? Larry King and Jeffrey Epstein. Oh wow! Okay. Oh, I actually went there. I didn't know that. Yeah, I uh, mean, Fred if Wilpon. You went to anywhere. Uh, Fred Wilpon. Uh, owner of the Mets, bunch right? of bunch of baseball players, bunch of guys that made Johnny, it. To... Johnny Franco, Pete Falcone, um, uh, I think the um, the artist uh, Julian Schnabel went there too. I do know him, not personally, but Rhea, I know others. Rhea Perlman. Saw I saw she was on a notable alumni oh, okay. on the list. Yeah. And then um, we went to, that out. went to St. John's. Yeah, we did our research. We didn't want to come unprepared. I used to tell my mom about the Did you know about Jeffrey Epstein? I did not. I never Epstein heard that connection? before. I did not hear that before. I'm going to have to look that up. Like, uh, people went to Lafayette High School. I didn't realize that. I know he's a little older <laughs> than you, so I mean, you might know people that knew of him, for all you know. Um, yeah, I'm sure. And so you yeah, went um you definitely did your homework. And then uh, you attended St. John's uni- University. Yeah, I didn't I didn't go to it long. It was about a year. Yeah. Is it true, and this is from an interview you previously did, you were selling Quaaludes for a while. I want to know why everyone in the eighties loved Quaaludes so much. They look fun just from Wolf of Wall Street. Was that just like the drug of choice? Uh they made you horny and they made you um uh Mellow. So it was a good combo. I wasn't oh, yeah. in big into yeah. taking yeah. them. Yeah, they but I definitely moved them. Yeah, yeah, and I moved, I didn't move the uh, pharmaceutical. These were bootleg. Oh, the bootleg ones. Even better. Yeah. Yeah, the lemons. Uh, lemons. Four dollars <laughs> each, three for ten. <laughs> good and deal. so after, after St. John's, then you kind of got into the restaurant business. Um, did you get into cooking? I know you're a self-taught chef. Did you get into cooking after college, or was it something that you always liked doing? Like, what made you decide to get into the business? Um, I can't really tell you why I specifically did. <clears throat> I didn't go right from school to cooking. I worked at uh, Lord and & Taylor, um, and uh, let me shut this off. That must be it. What kind of car do you have? Caddy. Caddy, nice, nice. What color? Go, what, good what, choice. Steel gray. Steel gray. Yeah, what am I? What am I going to drive? A fucking Altima? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, if you wanted to. You can do what you want, man. You're a my legend. Grandpa, my grandpa had a Cadillac too, so I like. Uh, I was supposed to get it in, his, in the will, but uh, fucking Frank, my aunt's. Fucking husband, fucking piece of shit. He ended up taking it. Fuck him. He got, uh, he got the cash. Was it a big? What year? Oh god, it must have been like. I want to. Yeah, I don't it, there. it's a truck. I mean, I really give a fuck. My car's got golf clubs in it. My racket for racquetball, cigar smoke. The fucking fury is yellow. It was beige when I got it. Uh, <laughs> You're something of an artist yourself, I guess. <laughs> Just changing it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to turn it in. It's a fucking lease. Um, so, I don't know what they're going to... So. so, you, um, after yeah, after college and working some places around the city, you eventually moved to New Orleans for a few years. Worked at Commander's Palace, a uh, legendary New Orleans mm-hmm. restaurant. I actually, I've been there. I was there with my ex-girlfriend when I went to New Orleans. This was like 2016. I remember the food being good. The company wasn't, though, because I really didn't like her that much. We're not together anymore. But I, I do remember. Ex-fiance? Yeah, technically. 
I, I kind of blocked that part of my life out. But um, you worked there for a while. So what was it like? So this was in the 80s. You were in New Orleans. What was it like living in New Orleans in the 80s? Well, we got to back up there. So I left St. John's, and then I worked at my friend's uh, meat, like a meat store, but it was in the meat district in New York, downtown. Is that like the and, Tenderloin uh, district? Uh, well, they don't really call it Tenderloin. Uh, I know Tenderloin is somewhere, but not in New York. So it was the meat district, you know, downtown, like 14th Street, and now it's like hip. But back then in the 70s, by well, this late 70s, <coughs> it was all fucking meat, meat, I mean, big time meat players at, uh, places that sold to all the other fucking, they sold wholesale to all the stores around the city. That's where you got your meat, where it's where all the, you know, the stores delivered, got their meat. And then I went to Lord and Taylor, which is, you know, Lord and Taylor department store, right? I was a store detective, and for some reason I went to go talk to the executive chef. She was a woman cooking for the president of the store. And she gave me a, uh, I asked her, I don't know what laid me, because I didn't come from a big cooking household, and I didn't really cook at home. Uh, a little here and there. But she got me a job in a restaurant, and that's how I got my, in Manhattan, which was Nouvelle French, and that's how I really got my start. <clears throat> so I worked in a couple of restaurants, and then I had the opportunity to go to New Orleans, because my friend was there, and that's when I jumped on. It was the early 80s, and that's how I wound up in New Orleans. Did you have a lot of fun when you were down there? No, because you're working, and everybody's fucking carrying on. I mean, Mardi Gras was great. But, you know, you're working, and, um, and I was in the Garden District where Commanders was. And then I worked in the Quarter, which was the younger version of Commanders called Mr. B's. And, um, yeah, again, you know, it's just fucking working while everybody's having a good time, drinking, carrying on, and you're working. But I was young. I was, like, 21, 22, 23. What, uh, where did you start in the restaurant? What position? And then how high did always, you get? Always prep, prep. Prep. I was doing prep in New York. Maybe I moved up to, uh, yeah, I think I was still doing prep. Prep and maybe salads or some shit. I was just getting started. So to keep pace in fucking New Orleans, I mean, it's so busy that you got to know, you know, the, the broiler, the fucking grill, or, you know, the saute station. You better know what the fuck you're doing. You better be fast. I ask this in all honesty. Did you have a resume at all that you brought from like New York to like Louisiana? I'm just wondering what like a resume looks like back in the 80s with computers and printers. No, no resume. I just walked in. I spoke to the chef. So actually, the first fucking job I got was a place called uh, Arnaud's. And uh, I walked in like a big shot. Yeah, I'm from New York. I want to work it. Just put me anywhere. And. He goes, oh, okay, and he put me on the sauté station, and I got fucking buried. Had no idea what I was fucking doing. They fired me the next day. One day. And, uh, you only got one day? One day, one day. They even be lying here, uh, maybe. Because I lied to them, and uh, I oh. cost them fucking shit. So the next place I went to, I said, look, I'm just starting out. I want to learn fucking wherever you can put me. <laughs> I want to work. There you go. Okay. So you might have yeah. oversold yourself, your abilities, yeah. the first time. It was nothing yeah, wrong with I, I, yeah. Yeah, shoot for I sold it. I just couldn't back it up. Yeah. And so you're there for a couple of years. You made your way back to Brooklyn. You eventually opened up your own restaurant. <laughs> I'm sorry. Art. Uh, well, from there, a woman I did uh, prep with who became a chef later in this restaurant in Bay Ridge. This, by then, I moved to, had moved to Bay Ridge. I got in my own apartment at 20, but then I went to New Orleans, and I, but I still kept the apartment. Some guys uh, were living in it. Uh, I rented it out to this guy. I sublet it. So I, and then I came back to New Orleans, and this woman that I worked with, my first restaurant was the chef of this new restaurant in Bay Ridge, this new neighborhood, um, new restaurant in this neighborhood I'm living in. And um, she immediately, you know, took me, and I wound up replacing her. Um, and that was my first chef job at 24. And it was a big, beautiful, multi-million dollar, won awards for architecture. 
And I was uh, 24 and chef this restaurant, but uh, I was living hard. I was, you know, seven days a week, all day and night. Then I'd go out drinking. It was, you know, it was rough. Yeah, I mean, I have friends in the service industry still, and that's pretty much still the lifestyle for most of them. Yeah. 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 Drink every night. I mean, I didn't get into drugs and shit, but it was always right next door was, a, you know, a block. Next block was like a good club where, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you jumped during the week. It was fucking mellow. And uh, so you still wound up from work and you want to go out. Um, Yeah. So that was the fucking life. It, it's a grind. Well, I, I've got two questions here, culinary related. Um, one, not to not to go back to your uh, your your horrors, but what was it like at that saute when you were at the saute cook and like you just like knew that you weren't like doing these right and like like what were you thinking to yourself? Like, was it like goddamn? Like, what am I doing? Well, right now? Uh, so in New Orleans. You do your prep, and you get ready for the fucking night, and it's busy. And then everybody sits down at a table in the kitchen with the chef. You get a beer, and you have this fucking beautiful dinner. I was like, holy shit, 45 minutes fucking, you know, from 5 to 5.45. I was like, wow, I'm, you know, fucking never did that in New York. It's always eating on the run, standing up, and whatever, you know, there was this family meal at, say, 11.30 and 3.30, um, but everybody sat down like gentlemen. I said, oh, this is fucking great. Six o'clock came, the fucking orders started coming in. This is one of the busiest restaurants in New Orleans, world famous, Arno's. And I, the chef used to expedite, pull out the orders over a loudspeaker. And he was Cajun and I couldn't fucking understand him. So he's fucking calling out shit. And I'm asking, what the fuck was that? What did he say? And I'm trying to fucking cook and keep up and saute. And meanwhile, the fucking shit, I'm just putting it out. And I know it's fucking raw, raw <laughs> sauce. I just fucking put it out, put it on. And then, like, ten minutes later, the fucking waiters started coming back with the fucking food. And they threw me off the station. And uh <laughs> it was a fucking horror. So the next day when I go to punch in... It's a big black guy standing by the time clock. And he goes, chef, don't think you should punch in. I go, what does that mean? <laughs> he goes, should have punched in. I go, am I fired? Uh, I got a fucking job or what? And he looked at me and I go, all right, I get it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was that fucking had security to make sure you didn't come back. <laughs> They're like, we got to get this guy, stick, keep him away. No, this this guy was like a big country kid. I mean, he was like fucking 6'6", six, six, 350, you know. Uh, yeah, I learned my lesson after that. That was a fucking horror. <laughs> that sounds yeah. like a fun day. The way you tell it, that was good. Yeah. That was a really good story. I like the part with, you don't understand what the Cajun guy is saying, which I understand. He just kept yelling to at me. I'm going, what? What are you saying? And the cooks is telling me this, that. And he's yelling, and he's yelling at me, cook, cook, cook. I go, I'm trying to cook. I don't know what the fuck he's saying. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it didn't work out. Yeah. So, what, um, uh, in, <laughs> go ahead, Chris. I was just going to ask, what, um, what do you know now that you can cook really well? Or when you were cooking at the place that you became a chef, like what what was your specialty? Obviously, I know it's probably Cajun cooking, Creole, but um, Wait. what's something that you just like to make? Yeah, for well, back. Well, right now I'm uh, actually making. I stopped, and I don't really like peas. Me neither. But I had this urge because I'm laying off fucking uh, you know pasta. But I had this urge. Uh, I was in the supermarket. I saw fresh English peas. So I'm making that with uh, sautéed onions and butter and olive oil really slow. Got them nice and sweet. Uh, sautéed some garlic. Got it nice and brown. Uh, hit it with some pesto and peas and chicken stock. I just drained it, and I'm going to puree it. And I'm going to make little dittolinis, which is a little short, hollow pasta. And I'm going to eat that. I'm not a big pea guy, but I saw it, and I said, you know, that, that fucking looks good. And I'm going to make it. And so that's what I'm doing. I don't like, I mean, I haven't, 
you know, I'm trying to get back in shape. So I played golf every morning. Now I'm back at the gym. I went to go lift this morning. I used to do spin. You know, summer's golf. Winter's going to be back in the gym. But I play racquetball. So how the was gym. that? I've never played before in my life. It looks fun. Yeah, it's good. I play doubles. It's 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 fun. I got a regular crew and we play. Um, so yeah, so I'm making this uh, pea pasta. So pretty much, you know, all cuisine really interests me. Uh, my background is cooking is, I guess you'd say, French. Um, I didn't. I mean, I've worked probably in some run the mill time places. So wrong with it, you know. I like eggplant parmesan as long as it's not breaded. It's flour and egg. Uh, I guess my linguine with clam sauce is like, you know, I, you'll get into it, right? My cooking that I do for parties. But, um, yeah. um, yeah, so I could pretty much make anything, you know, if like a real ethnic dish, like an Indian dish, I'm not into Indian food. Well, I can't roll fucking sushi, but, you know, something like French dishes, Italian, um, can I make a mole, which a Mexican sauce? Not really. But I can look it up and get the gist of it and an idea and, you know, understand it. You know, it's easy once you know technique and what they're saying. It's all relative. Right. And so um, is it true that you had to eventually get out of business? You had to sell You owned a restaurant and you had to sell it to pay for gambling, for debt you had as a gambler. And then you moved to L.A. and started fresh. So did you really have – so you owned a restaurant and had to give it up because you owed some money? Yeah. So the building I lived in in Bay Ridge um, was a social club and uh, became available. And by that time, I was kicking around restaurants in you know, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Manhattan. And uh, it became available. And I said, look, there's this place. We should do something with it. And we were just going to make it a pizzeria sort of slash restaurant. And it became more full scale restaurant with a big bar. And it became a jumping place. It was like, you know, cool, hip food. Uh, and, um, big bar, a lot of broads, mobsters, you know, wherever there's broads in action in a restaurant or bars are going to be fucking mobsters. Uh, or oh, guys who want to be mobsters, or guys that think they're mobsters. Yeah, that'd be the one. So, that'd be me for sure. Yeah, the one that wants. Seems uh, like a fun place to hang out at. Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, it was, and I lived right upstairs, and it was. You know, we go. It'd be two, three, four in the morning. You know, sir. I think we served late. You know, I think twelve, one, two. Thursday, Friday, Saturday was fucking jumping. There was a long wait. You couldn't, you know, get in. It was. Long way for a table. Uh, so I was making a lot of money, and uh, I was a big sports guy. And, of course, you know, I get bored easily, and, you know, I love fucking action. So I was gambling, you know, 500 a game and looking up fucking weather in Denver and like fucking that Chris, Chris, is a, Chris likes gambling, too. He's nodding his head over there. <laughs> and I'm fun. thinking... Uh, you know, Blizzard in Denver, how are they going to throw the ball? How are they going to catch it? How are they going to, you know, be slipping and sliding? I'm taking the fucking under. And it'd be fucking 31-28 by halftime. I'm going, what the fuck? <laughs> so, never bet the you know. Under. Um, so, you know, I just like fucking, you know, good gamblers to pick one or two games and that's it. Me, I had to have fucking action in everything. Everything. Teases, yeah. <laughs> fucking reverses, fucking straight up. And then, you know, four o'clock game, you try to make up what you lost at one. Of course. And then yeah. you try to bail out at fucking, you're chasing by the eight o'clock game. And it's a fucking horror. And you're down 2,000, <laughs> 3,000. You know, once in a while you win, you're down, you're down. So the last game of the year, I fucking sent it in. And giant game. And back then, you know, this is 90. Um, one game, you know, it was not the ESPN. You couldn't watch all these games, right? The giant game, the jet game, and then the Sunday night game. So Giants are west, resting their fucking, they're going into the playoffs to rest in their players. Favored by 12 and a half against the Patriots. They get, they lose 12-10. 13-10. 13-10. Giants lost. It was 15,000. Doubled up on the Jets. 
of course, they fucking lost, or they won. I forgot which way I went. And now I'm the wrong way. way. <laughs> and yeah, I went the wrong way. And now I'm doubling up. And the guy goes, my bookie. Joe, there's a lot of fucking money. You're going to fucking back this up? I was like, come on. I got the fucking restaurant. <clears throat> if it loses, I got 60000 And Houston, Ash- Houston, Ash- Houston Oilers against the fucking Pittsburgh Steelers. All right, right now. Cody Cost- I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what happens, but I'm taking the Oilers in this one. I don't know what it was. Well, the money line would have the same. Yeah, I took the Steelers, number one defense uh-huh. against... Uh, the Oilers, and of course, Steelers going to the playoffs, they're resting the players. Houston's got nothing to lose. This guy, Cody Carlson, throws for 500 yards, and I got buried. Oh. And by halftime, because we had big TVs up above the bar, three TVs, and they're looking at me like, you know, Joe, you look fucking pale, you don't look right, you're not talking, you're just like, you're out of it. I go, I'm just tired, you know, I'm just... And I'm saying to myself, I fucking lost everything. I'm done. How am I going to pay these fucking guys 60000 So I told my partners, I said, look, I fucked up. Now, back up to where I got my start in acting, just to fucking. When I was working with chef in restaurants between Nightfalls, which was my first job, and 30, which was when I opened up this restaurant with these guys, I was working in a restaurant in Manhattan, and <clears throat> a waiter said, hey, um, and he's still friends with me today, good guy. He said, um, I have a theater company. I'm doing this play. Why don't you come audition for it? I think, you'd, you know, you'd be good. It's called The Juice Men. I was the mobster. I lent money on the piers or the docks, you know, to longshoremen. And I got the role, and I studied for like a year. Didn't get much out of it, but I liked it. I got out of the restaurant business. And started being broke, so I got out of that fucking fucked acting. He threw me out of the class. It was a four-year class, year and a half. I went back into the restaurant business. So when I lost all this money, I said, cash me out to my, my, uh, my, now, cash me out to my pawn. I played off the bookie. My friend Tim, who got me in there, was going to be a priest. But he saw, like, I think a movie, I think it was Raging Bull. And Martin Scorsese was going to be a priest. And that inspired him to get out of Villanova. Oh, he went to Villanova, but get out of the priesthood and become an actor. He's a working actor today. He's very, you know, very good actor. Really, he studied with his teacher the whole four years. I didn't. I said, Tim, I fucked up. Either I'm going to go to Italy and cook there, or I'm going to come see you and pursue acting. And he goes, well, I'm house-sitting in the Hollywood Hills at a producer's house. Come and join me. So I got there Saturday, I think. Sunday, I woke up. The Chicago Bears were playing the Giants. I said, this is fucking beautiful. Looking at the city. I go, this is fucking great. He goes, don't get used to it. <laughs> we got to leave in two weeks. So I, um, I, uh, I, uh, well, that's why I stayed there for three and a half years. So that's how I got to pursue acting. Yeah, so you got your first your first big break in 1993. Uh, you continue to get some big, some small parts throughout the 90s. Then you get the opportunity of a lifetime being on The Sopranos. But your first appearance wasn't as Vito. You were as uh, Gino, a customer at a pastry shop. So how did that whole opportunity come about? Well, you fucking missed a big chunk. We want to get to the good stuff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Joe. Yeah, we got time for the good stuff. So I'm living in L.A. and uh, was kicking around. And, you know, I think I'm working in restaurants. <clears throat> you know, you can't get a fucking agent because you got no work. And you got no work because you don't have an agent. Catch 22. So I finally got myself an audition. I don't know how. Back pages of fucking whatever it's called. And I had my picture. I did these headshots. And I just had on the, my resume acting teacher, Bob Patterson. So the casting director looks at the fucking resume. She goes, when did you start acting? Yesterday? I had no credits. I said, okay. I went back home. I fucking made up all this theater credits and <laughs> acting uh, movies and shorts. There you go. I made up fucking, what you need to do. 
<laughs> I made up titles. I made up characters. And I said, they're never going to fucking know what's the difference. So what does it matter? So I put fucking my, like, my Tim says, why don't you call it the nuisance? Because I was always bothering him about shit. He calls, why don't you say, <laughs> why don't you call a movie, one movie called Nuisance, the nuisance, and you're, uh, you're Mr. Fuji. <laughs> And then I started naming directors out of fucking place kickers in the NFL. I said, they're not going to fucking know. So I made up about, I don't know, 10 credits in theater, 10 credits in film. Directed and, by Morton Anderson. Uh, yeah, Morton Anderson. <laughs> Actually, it was uh, Ray Worshing was a director from the uh, 49ers. And um, all these talents that I could, you know, fucking ride a horse, fucking, uh, you know, Oof, I don't know what the fuck I did. And I finally had a nice fucking resume they could at least look at. So that was the first step. The second thing was, was uh, you know, you can't get it. It's hard to get an agent. But I did these one-act plays. So I was there a couple of years, three, four years. And I did these one-act plays in downtown L.A. It was called Al's Bar. And I had all these ad vanguard fucking seven-minute plays. And you'd go... Or maybe it had something to do with monologue. And all these directors, you know, wrote these plays, which were all bullshit. But in one, uh, one, maybe they were like 15 one-act plays, seven to eight minutes each. And the director would give you like, yeah, I got to roll for you in this one. I got to roll for you in this one. So you wind up doing seven, eight fucking plays in one night. So you had to learn all these different roles. Right. So I did that. And this kid comes up to me and goes, listen, I'm starting my own agency. I'd like to represent you. I said, really? He said, wow, that'd be fucking great. When are you opening? Well, I'm open. I'm going to you know, get the breakdowns, work out of my apartment until they get established. And then, you know, I said, oh, okay, great. I don't give a fuck. I was thinking, wow, I got a fucking agent. That's so great. Nice. He loved you in the so, new sense. He must have saw the movie. He might probably did. Yeah. Back then, you could get it at Blockbuster. So... <laughs> Uh, just got a puff on this. It's all right. So I'm waiting a couple of weeks for him, to, or maybe a month, and I'm saying, oh, it's going to come, it's going to come, it's going to come. The day finally comes. I'm all hopped up. I'm smoking cigarettes. I'm drinking coffee, fucking 7-Eleven. I lived in West Hollywood. And um, 9 o'clock comes. I said, I'm going to go to his apartment. I'm going to get the breakdown, see what the breakdowns look like. You know what the breakdowns are, right, Chris? But Kyle, yeah. do you know? Uh, it's where, like, with all the casting calls, like, scenes, isn't that you were basically doing the research on your own and calling the people that called the shots in right. terms of casting, right? right? So they say, this, yeah, no, they would say, I'm looking for a TV show, I don't know, Love Boat. I, I don't even know what was done around there in the 90s. Uh, I need a guy, he's a waiter, he's got three lines, uh, you know, whatever they were looking for, movies, theater, TV shows. If your client resembled that and could play that role, you submit his picture. Hopefully, you get an audition, right? So I see the breakdowns in front of his door, and I go, uh, "Danny, it's nine o'clock." Uh, what, what the, and he's fucking. He just got out of bed. I go, "It's your first day of fucking business. Where are you? What, what's going on?" And he goes, "Ah, oh, you know, I, I don't know how to get to it." And I'm going, "What the fuck? I got the breakdowns. Let's go." I started going through the breakdowns. I'm right for this. I'm right for this. Right. And three days of doing that. And he goes, listen, I can't operate like this. You got to be fucking driving me nuts. If anything comes through, I'll fucking call you. So I said, this guy's not a fucking hustler. So I started getting up very early because eight actors can't get the breakdowns. And I started taking the breakdowns, run to Kinko's, copy them and bring them back to his house. And I take them home, and I go through the breakdowns and started submitting my picture. Mm-hmm. And then I call up the casting director, and I made up my manager's name. I made up my name was James Holden. I call up the casting director, and said, "Hi, I submit my client Joe Ganaspoli for a role that you're casting. I'm in town for a few days. I want to make sure he gets this audition." And they'd say, "What's your name?" I said, "James Holden. I only deal with a few uh, New York actors, mostly theater." Uh, I saw Joe want to play, and uh, I wanted to just get and make sure he gets this role. And I started getting myself auditions. 
This was back, you know, answering machines. It was you reached the theatrical office of uh, James Hoving. I told my uh, roommate, "Don't answer the phone because, you know, it could be fucking things." So he's like, "You're nuts. This will never work." I started getting myself auditions, and he wanted me to do it for him, which was pretty funny. So that's how I got my first role called Money for Nothing, and that's when I got my SAG card. And that movie was a true story, but it was with James John Cusack. Michael Madsen, who my scene was with, which was pretty cool. I was That's a day cool. play, and they flew me out to Pittsburgh. And Vicki Thomas, who's a big-time casting director, she still is. Um, uh, Benicio Del Toro, right? Benicio Del Toro. He's a Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, Philip Seymour there were a Hoffman. lot of good people in that movie. Yeah. Uh, Michael Rappaport. Lenny like Benito. Um, yeah, so my scene was with Madsen. It was a day play. They flew me out to Pittsburgh, which they never do. But uh, that was it. The movie sucked. I thought it was, you know, it was a true story. But anyway, I met Benicio. Um, keep calling you. And you fucking don't get the idea. And... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we were in the same movie and doing this. I'm directing this short movie. I want you to be the lead. It's with um, Matthew McConaughey. And we it in a hotel. We were undercover cops doing a drug deal. So that was pretty cool. And um, I uh, kicked around. Maybe I did Ed Wood with Johnny Depp. And But I stayed friends with Benicio. And I moved back to New York. I had enough for fucking L.A. He got me in two movies, and the casting directors was uh, Soprano, uh, George Ann Walken, and Sheila Jaffe. And they said, you're in our movies. We don't know who you are. Why don't you come and meet you? So I just want you to get it caught up, because that's what I got there. Yeah. And what is, is that you really got to make your own breaks. I made my own break, because I hustled, and that's what I do. You know, I try to think outside the box. So, and it works. Said, yeah, that's that's a pretty cool story, origin story. Yeah, that's um, yeah. And um, she said, "Do you have an agent?" I said, "No." She said, "Well, keep in touch with the office every few months. We'll tell you if we're doing something." And I did. And then she said, "We got this show, and we want you to do this role. We'll come and audition for this role, Gino, the bakery customer." I said. Hey, you know, I don't really want to do TV. I just like movies. And they go, you don't even have a fucking agent. Just come in and do this. Don't, what are you kidding me? So, of course, I did, and I got it, and I played Gino, the bakery customer. All right. I caught you up. All right. Sorry. I mean, I had all that stuff in there. I know the story about you acting as your own as your own agent, which I thought is hilarious, very creative. The The creating, making up all the fake shit on your resume, all these fake plays and Theater credits. Chris, I really think you should maybe look into that. That's an idea that'll still work. I think it's a little bit I wish more I had that now. fucking resume. <laughs> I wish I had that resume. But, you know, I only took one uh, one headshot. Because I was like, I used that headshot. I only took one headshot in my life. And I remember going to Topanga Canyon to do it. So it's fucking theater. I'm thinking about Charles Manson. This is where Charles Manson lives around here. And, uh, um, Still got me? Am I good? Yeah. 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 And um, I used that forever. And um, I got it somewhere on my Facebook or one of my, it's a profile pic I use once in a while. It's the only headshot I ever used. And um, so I did that role. And for some reason, they brought me back as Vito. Which was a very lucky break for you. Um I guess, what was it like on set in those early days? Like, obviously, the show was a huge hit right off the bat. But, like, in those well, early seasons, or I mean, after the really. first season, right? Yeah, after the first season. First season had, like, a cult following. Okay. And, you know, very few people, like, by the eighth episode, which was what I was in, I knew people were talking about it. Like, Wall Street was hit to it. They right. knew what was going on. Um. And um, by the after the first year, it became really everybody started catching on. I mean, I, I think uh, you, I think a lot of people bought 
I think HBO as a company just it even became bigger just because so many people wanted to watch The Sopranos and subscribe to it. And well, that put HBO on the map. Yeah. Really. Definitely. Yeah. Did you, um, I guess in those early seasons as it was blowing up, like I know in hindsight it's 2020, but at the time did it dawn on you that you were a part of, you were a part of something that was like, holy shit, this might be like, go down in history or was it one of those things where you had tunnel vision and you're just focused on the job at hand? You don't well, have to I mean, stop after and smell the first, roses. After the first season, I mean, I wasn't, I mean, I did that scene. I wasn't thinking like, Oh, I hope they bring me back. You know, I, you know, I wasn't really, I just did it and thought I'd go, you know, do some more movies. I was filming Mickey blue eyes at the time too. And, uh, you know, I just did it and not, not thinking it, it, it was going to be as big as it was. And then they brought me back as Vito. Uh, you know, I auditioned for Vito. And uh I was, you know, by then I guess I was hoping I got it. And I guess the Georgie Ann Walken, I guess she was big friends of Benicio. And, uh oh, I don't know how that worked. But she took a shine to me, I guess, which I was lucky. And, uh, you know, season two and three, at the end of season three, I got to kill Jackie Jr., yeah, and then um, Kyle, I'll let you tell me what happens idiot. in season four. He deserved it. Yeah, where did you, that was a weird scene because you like came, you kind of like appeared out of nowhere, you and the car. Yeah, and but, um, yeah, that was an inside joke because that was really big then, and I was trying to get in this small fucking car. Yeah, and it took me forever, and uh, you know, I was kind of, I was like. What the fuck is with this car? You know, David directed it. Um, yeah, that was uh, into a small car. Yeah, and struggling, struggling to get in with my fucking hips. So, what happens in season four? Do you want to have tell it or should I? Because you did your homework. I, I mean, I'm enjoying this. However, you want to do it. I was just going to ask you for one, like what, uh, that what's the shooting schedule like? For a show like that, I guess what's the typical? What was the typical day like for you? Are you there on days you're not shooting because you want to watch other people's performances? Are you allowed to do that? Well, I could, I could have, but I wasn't doing that. I mean, it was in Jersey or at the studio. You know, there was no reason for me to go there, and you know, I, I mean, I didn't really know where they were going to be, and so you know, if I wasn't working, I wasn't there. But here's the thing that. Uh, you're missing Kyle, and because uh, you're the research guy. Season four comes, and I did season two, season three, a couple episodes. You know, background here. I'm with Ralphie. I'm in Kill Jackie Jr. Season four comes, and this is again uh, Christian thinking outside the box. So two big breaks, right? Finally get a fucking movie with the uh, an agent bet. Season four comes, and I'm reading a book called Murder Machine. And I suggest to the writer, Robin Green, I'm reading a book about a gay mobster. And I think it'd be pretty cool to portray it uh, because you never see it in uh, mob. And the reason why I did that was, one, is because I wanted to prove I can act because I'm sort of self-taught. I wanted a storyline. I thought it'd be cool to, like, you know, have more scenes, more more of a challenge. I'm sure, yeah. So yeah. I gave him the book, and they said, oh, okay. And I didn't hear anything. Um, and by that time, there was a big break in between. So we did season four. Season five starts, and right before we're going back, they asked me what the name of the book was. And I knew they were thinking about it. But aside from that guy being gay, and the book was called Murder Machine, um, true story, took place in Brooklyn, and uh, notorious mobster Roy DeMeo had a crew that killed about 75 guys. One of the guys in his crew was gay. and um, But there was a guy in Jersey that they killed for being gay, but he was a captain, John D'Amato. And I think that put him over the edge to said. So they called me up and asked me the name of the book again. And I said, I'll just bring it in when we go back. And I gave it to them again. And I said, now nah, they're fucking thinking about it. Or oh, I didn't know what they were doing. They just said, oh, maybe they just, I don't know. 
So we get back to season uh, filming season five, and they did a line change before we we're about to shoot. And they said, Joe, Paulie's going to walk in Walnuts, Tony Sirico. They're going to ask you, hey, uh, Peter, where the fuck is my Tupperware? And you're going to say, take it easy. My wife's cleaning it. You'll get it. Something like that. But I'm saying to myself, that's kind of weird. Now I got a fucking wife, huh? So I didn't think anything of it. And uh, that was my first episode. So and then cut leading up to that with my security guard scene, one of the cast members got drunk and left the script in the cab. And they freaked out because then the paparazzi was following us all around, big crowds. They wanted to see who was, if they noticed any actors trying to get, like, info on, like, what was going to happen. You know, because everything was, like, so secretive. By that time, it was big gaps in between, a year maybe. You know, they, they everybody was jonesing for it. So they wanted to see what kind of fucking, you know, tips they can get. So they freaked out. And they stopped giving us uh, the scripts, and they always gave us our sides. So we started asking everybody had a mole. The crew, the set dresses, the costumes, the hair and makeup, props, they all got the script because they had to prepare for the next episode. So my guy was in props, and I'd go, what's going on next episode? Am I going to die? Am I getting killed? And you want to know, because then your fucking job is over. So he'd say, no, you're good. You you know, you got nothing going up. Uh, you got some good scenes. They don't kill you. You're good, good. So that went to three or four episodes. Finally, I asked him, what's going on this episode? He goes, oh, you're not getting killed, but uh, you got some good scenes. I said, really? He said, oh, I'm fucking great. He goes, all right, you'll see. I'll read it in the read-through. Uh, and I'm walking away, and he goes, oh, I forgot to tell you. You're going to be blowing a guy. And I went, what? I says, blowing a fucking guy. And I'm saying, holy shit. You're fucking doing it. But I go, that's not what I had in mind. <laughs> yeah, that's a little yeah, were you, you wish it was. would have been the other way around if it was going to be yeah, that way? Well, I was, on the, I was on the wrong end of the blowjob. <laughs> so I'm thinking like, holy fuck, my neighborhood, my friends are going to fucking flip. They're going to break my balls. And then... You know, I wasn't married at the time. Everybody's going to think I'm a fucking homo. Nothing's anything wrong with it, you know, with that fucking thing. But still, I love fucking broads. So I'm thinking like, oh, the fucking ball break, and then I'm going to go through and this and that. So I get to the read-through, and that's where everybody sits at a table. Everybody's in that episode. And first thing out of Sirico's mouth, fully walnuts, rest in peace, he goes... You, everybody know my friend Joe, the cocksucker? That was the first fucking thing. I can hear him say it. <laughs> Stevie Van Zandt said, they're going to break your balls in the neighborhood. I said, I know. And Jimmy took yeah. me aside and says, listen, if you're not comfortable doing this, we'll go talk to David. You don't have to do it. I said, it's, I'm kind of fucking ass for it. Um, it's not what I had in mind, but I want to talk to I them mean, because if they treat it like a Russian... You know, I don't just want to blow up a guy and then forget about it. You know, and they said, okay. it's the only thing we're going to see this year, but next year, be ready. It's going to be a big year for you. And that's yeah. what happened. And that's a genius move on your part. You essentially made yourself the lead, one of the lead actors for the part one of season well, six. it changed my life. Tell the truth. Absolutely. It changed my life because I would have been a background guy. And, you know, a couple of lines here and then. I've been like, yeah, I sort of remember you, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you played Vito, part of the crew. But it opened up so many doors for me. When, um, but not the acting doors, which is what I wanted, which is why I did it. I thought I'd get more roles, you know, or, uh, right. auditions. And, you know, that really didn't happen. It happened some, but not as big as I thought. When, um, when you were living your double life um, away from, from Jersey, I got to ask, how were the pancakes that that guy, your, your, uh, your, your lover on the show, how were they that he was making, that he was cooking up? Yeah, did you actually, you obviously got to at least try them. It's always, the first always called, so. it was called Johnny Cakes. Johnny, Johnny cakes. cakes. 
Johnny Cakes. Right. So pancakes are made with, you know, flour. These are made with white cornmeal. Okay. All right. And they want Johnny Cakes. But by that time, they're fucking cold. And, you know, he's just like not off the fucking grill. It's all, you know. Right. So you taste one or two. It's cold syrup. It's fucking pancakes. And, you know, you eat it once, twice. You can't eat you fucking take after take after cake. You know, you're not really eating it much. So, you know, it's in the quiet days. I mean, it's not horrible, but it's like, you know, it's cornmeal. It's like eating polenta, which is Italian, which is served hot or cold. Right. Or deep fried. It's usually served hot. But, yeah, so that was that was that. You, um, so you had said before that you had to be, when it, when you were, like, pitching, you or anyone else would pitch ideas to writers. You had to be really low-key about it. You didn't want other actors to see you do it. Um, is that because you knew that they would give you shit? Is that, like, a faux pas on set to do so? Or do you, was it because it would harbor some jealousy and resentment? I mean, obviously, you created well, pretty much a huge role for yourself. Yeah, so you don't want to, like, it'd be frowned upon, like, you know, hey, why don't you have my character, you know, come up with an idea that Tony, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to give the ideas to fucking the writers, and you don't want to say, hey, that'd be great for me, and, you know, you just go along with the flow. So I had to do it on the QT, grab the writer alone, just get her the book, tell her what it's about, and just forget it, and I did that. I had just had this moment to do it. Um, and, uh, that worked out. Robin Green and, and uh, Mitch Burgess, um, they were married. They kicked, they started Blue Bloods. Oh, um, yeah. okay. so that idea was the only, uh, suggestion that David Chase took from an actor. Damn. Uh, Good which was pretty cool. Yeah. And, um, I think I was like, to, I mean, Patsy Parisi played his twin brother, and I think uh, Santiago, the the woman with the school, with Camilla's trying to get someone in, played a twin also. But I was totally someone different with a different name. And so, I mean, I was lucky that they brought me back. I got it, and they did the idea. So... Again, I was sort of thinking outside the box. How can I get fucking, you know, make something out of this? And I'm lucky I did, because we're not talking right now if they didn't. Yeah, that's true. I mean, once that episode was out, as you said, you sounds like you got shit from people you knew, other actors, and when you were out in public. I mean, uh, well, I didn't get shit from the other actors. They didn't break my balls about it. Guys and my friends, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, broke balls in a good way. Some broke balls. <coughs> Mobsters, some guy, you know, gangsters that I knew stopped talking to me. Uh, they think I don't you were actually role. sucking the guy's dick or something? It's not like you were actually doing it. <laughs> well, that. they didn't want to see Mobsters portrayed as queers. You know, that was the thing. Right. Um, and, um, yeah, I had a problem with one kid in a fucking club and his uncle was a fucking captain and, uh, he just got out. This kid's dead now. And um, we went at it at a fucking club, and they go, Joe, you don't know what, you know, I was fucking hammered. He was hammered. And I, they said, Joe, you don't even know who the fuck that guy is. His uncle is so-and-so. I was like, I don't give a fuck. The fuck is wrong with coming after me like out of a fucking role? So that was a problem. Did you ever, um, I mean, I'm watching The Sopranos right now, my second run through and I gotta say all the scenes between you and Finn like after Finn has caught Vito and Vito knows you do really they're just hilarious like you guys did such a good job together where you're coming off as both super friendly and very very menacing and Finn is just freak the fuck out so I mean uh, I thought that water party was my favorite scene (laughs) you know I love that hey Finn what's up buddy (laughs) I love that doing. I got that in two takes, and I was really surprised. But I was just like, you know, just fucking in the zone and fucking hit every fucking mark that I wanted to, and you know, it just flowed out. And and I was like, we're moving on. I was like, really? I, I said, you don't, I, you don't want me to do it again? And you got it? And they go, no, we got it. I go, you sure? You know, because. Awesome. 
I mean, so that was one of those. Fucking... Yeah, yeah. Two takes I did it in, which is very rare. They never move on, especially with Sopranos. You know, it was take after take after take, and, you know, it'd be some glitch, whether it be, you know, lighting or fucking sound or uh, someone, you know, missing their mark or fucking up a line, and boom, we got it. Did you watch the show yourself while it was on air? Or do you not like Oh, yeah. It? Yeah. I mean, it's a good storyline from what I've, yeah, from what I've heard. Well, you don't know. I mean, you do it at the read through. You hear the read through. But you don't know how they're going to cut it and what, you know, what happens. I mean, you know what in the read through, but then you forget how it all works, the music. So that's cool, you know? Yeah. And it was, um, uh, it was cool uh, on the show. Like, I mean, it was crazy for that time period to have, you know, a gay mobster as the center of a show like that for a while. And the way it was very respectfully done. I mean, on one side, you guys, like, obviously on the Jersey side of things, you know, they're all giving the character shit and want to kill him because he's gay. But then, you know, your life, Vito's life in New Hampshire with Johnny Cakes, I mean, it was very... It was a sad story in sense. I mean, Vito could have stayed there, obviously. I mean, he didn't want to leave the mob life, which I can't blame him. All that money coming in, it'd probably be hard to walk away from. But Well, he missed the life, you know, the nightlife when I was hanging out with those guys when I was in New Hampshire. I'm like, come on, you know, where's everybody's going? You know, they were, I don't know what we were doing, playing cards or at a bar. It was yeah. like 10, 10, 30. They were going home. I was like, you know, I wasn't used to that lifestyle. Yeah. And I missed the action. And, um, you know, I went back into the life, and that's what ultimately got me killed. Right. Um, I mean, you but they made, I'm, I'm glad the way they did my character, because they made it more sentimental. If I was a guy that just got blowed and then kicked the shit out of the guy, you know, which I hated myself for being a homo, which those guys exist, um, um, that would have been, yeah. you know, that would have been sentimental. But people felt bad that, you know. Yeah, if you were only known for just one episode, you blew a guy and then immediately got killed in the same episode, like, the notoriety, people would still remember you, but yeah. Oh, uh, you had a fun. Yeah, that would have been horrible. They could have really, I mean, but thank God they had a great storyline, and like, you know, I, I'm grateful what they did, the way they did it. Uh, I didn't understand that at the time, but I'm appreciative now. Yeah, that would have been, that would have, that would have sucked. I would have been ever known as the fucking, uh, that would have sucked. Oh, uh, more ways than one. Yeah, yeah, no fun offended <laughs> there. Um, out of out of everyone that you uh, that a you worked with or just being on set watching them, who was your um, who was someone that you really admired as a uh, as a professional? <laughs> well, like being a giant fan, Lawrence Taylor, and yeah, you got to the fact that, that I got to work with him. him. Yeah, I mean that was a big thrill for me. He's obviously not an actor, but, you know, he's one of my three idols. Uh, Muhammad Ali and Jackie. And Muhammad Ali came to the set once, and I got a picture with him, which is great. And Jackie Robinson. Those are my top three. Um, other than that, uh, like, you know, Ben Kingsley would have been cool to work with. I didn't get to work with him. Uh, Lauren Bacall would have been cool. Uh, you know... I don't even think I worked with Frank Loggia. Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, the guy who played Johnny Cakes was a really good New York actor. He was well respected by Julie, uh, George M. Walker and Sheila Jaffe. And uh, he was great. I happened to know him. He was a friend of my friend Tim's who got me started. We did a movie t- together. So it was kind of like a little relieved when I walked in and saw it was him playing Johnny Cakes because I knew him. Um, and that was kind of cool. Um, you were definitely showing off your acting skills in those scenes. I imagine it's not totally fun kissing another man. Well, a big thing was, you know, we were rolling around the fucking hay, and we had the kiss, and his fucking mustache was going in my mouth. And I said, I'm going to fucking bomb it. we got to do something with that. And they brushed it up and tried to fucking put that. I said, listen. Let's just fucking do it and get out of here because, you know, I don't mind playing the fucking homo, but, you know, I'm not going to be blowing you and I'm not going to be sticking it in your ass 
And then I got a stick it in my ass. He's rolling so, around in the grass. It's, it's yeah, like I mean, it's far fighting. away. We, we could fucking just do it and get out. So we did it. Yeah. And then you also, you're, I mean, you were a part of a lot of legendary scenes. Obviously, there's the GIF, the GIF, GIF, however you say it, that'll live on forever of you dancing as a... Uh, right. In the club, in the leather outfit. There's another, there's another gift with when I go like this when I make them, you know, dinner. Yeah. And uh, someone pointed out, I think I was the the only one to have an internal monologue when yeah. I'm working and soaring and don't want to look at my watch. <clears throat> People love that scene too. Yeah, just, uh, uh, yeah, nice. that is great. Yeah, the trying to not trying to make it to lunchtime without looking at your watch. It, is it, um, and I know, like, obviously people are going to say what they want to say. You know, I'd read, um, Post Sopranos, I guess, one actor in particular was outspoken, or he didn't like, I guess, maybe some of the notoriety you got playing Vito, being one of, like, the featured stars. I mean, we're talking about, uh, Steve, I would say, who played Bobby. You weren't, you were one of the few actors who didn't go on Talking Sopranos. I mean, I've listened to that show, and, he just does, he doesn't really have a lot of nice things to say about like pretty much anyone. It seems like he's a big shit talker. So I don't know what the story was there. <laughs> if it was just yeah, he's a weird the he's, a, he, he, he's a weird cat. Um, we were close for a while. Of course, they were all at my wedding. <clears throat> we talked a lot, and then I started getting busy with the show, and I guess he resented that. And it was said about him is that <clears throat> he's a type. That you know has a big bowl of ice cream in front of him, and he'll look at yours. So, uh, okay, we had some words, we had some problems, that's, and that's uh, a good analogy. I'm gonna have to say that one. <laughs> uh, and um, we didn't talk for a long time. Then he asked me to be on the fucking show, and I'm like, "Is he fucking kidding me?" Um, and I didn't do it. And I think a few actors didn't, right? Uh, Drea. Damn, Trey, now that's kind of weird. I mean, that's kind of weird because she was, was obviously. Trip. Yeah, Michael went on her show, but she didn't go on Michael his. Michael went on her show. And um, they were kind of close, obviously working together so much. So I don't know what happened there. Um, Vince Curatola did it? He's That's uh, Johnny Sack, right? Johnny Sack? Yeah. I I believe, I think he did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. you and Adriana are really the only two that didn't go on the show as far as, like, big biggest people. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so, yeah, I just, yeah, I didn't want to do it. I don't blame you. It was kind and of hard to listen it. to at times. Now, I don't think some I, people did say, when are you going to do it? Because they mentioned you, and they were co- pretty complimentary. They were nice. They didn't badmouth me, which I thought they would. Not Michael. I mean, I have a problem with Michael. Michael did a little something, which I was annoyed at, but uh, I still like him. Uh, he's a good guy. Uh, but the other guy, I think he was, because um, a couple of times I, I went back to listen to what they said. And they said, you know, he did a good job here. It was good. And this is because I said, how are they going to approach my episodes when not saying something? And then when it comes to it, are they going to badmouth me or what? But they were nice, so I was surprised. I think, anyway, unless I'm wrong. I think, um, I mean, it's good. I think it's you didn't miss out by not being on it. I feel like by from what I've listened to, I think uh, Michael was getting a bit annoyed with Steve at times. It seemed like Steve was a big personality to be around <laughs> talking about the show day in and day mm-hmm. out. But um, do you still, I mean, I, I imagine you can't go. I'm sure you probably... I mean, you probably don't travel as much as you used to these days, but I mean, I'm—I take it you probably get recognized pretty much every day, any day you're out in public, right? Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of traveling. I'm a couple of months ago, I was in Ireland for uh, doing a little cooking, but mostly appearances. Wales and England um, sold out of each one. It wasn't big venues, but you know, a couple of hundred people each one. Cool. Um, Fifteen years later, still you know attracting. That's cool. Um, so I've done a lot of traveling since the show. I had, you know, an NFL product that I have licensed. Uh, I've been spokesperson for a thing. I do my parties. 
uh, you know, airports, uh, pretty much um, everywhere. I mean, even deep down south, I was, you know, people were recognizing, which was pretty cool. It's, um, and it's all over the world. I mean, there was a lot of great yeah. shows, you know, The Wire and Breaking Bad, The Usuals, right? Mad Men, which is what I loved. But nobody talked about it at work the next day, you know? Restaurants right. didn't empty at 8 o'clock, so everybody could be home at 9. Um, and that's the difference between our shows and them. So, uh, and even my role was groundbreaking that yeah. no one did it as a mainstream mob guy, you know, playing a gay guy, uh, gay character. And then it became so much more common. A writer for the Village Voice, which is a gay New York paper, um, like all There's of them. A guy. What's that? I said like all of them. What? Just gay New York paper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is really gay. Uh, the voice, Village Voice, it's called. And uh, it's a yeah. show called Barry. Uh, with uh, the Bill Hader. Bill Hader. Hader. Yeah. Bill Hader. And a character came out as gay and like nobody flinched. Right. And then I think Another guy, rest in peace, Ray Liotta, might have been gay in his cop show. But there's been several characters that came out of me. The Y, Michael, uh, Kenneth, uh, uh, Michael, Michael K. K. Williams. Yeah. He, but he was gay. Um, but he said in the red, he goes, you were the first, and you're like the godfather of all the gay characters, which I thought was pretty cool and definitive. Um uh, article of all the articles written about my character. So that was pretty cool. I mean, I just wanted to make it as believable as possible. A guy that's torn and, you know, had this double life and, you know, was married, obviously liked women or thought he did and was attracted to men. So, and it's in every walk of life. So why not mob? For sure. I mean, must feel pretty awesome or crazy to think. I mean, you were a part of something that's going to be remembered. Forever, I guess it's until the meteor hits Earth and we're all <laughs> we all disappear. But television-wise, I mean, your show Sopranos is definitely the best show. One and two, it's always The Wire, Sopranos. But I mean, your people are going to be talking about the show for as long as television and exists. Bad. And break well, Rolling bad. Stone just rated it the number one show of all time, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that, right. shows. And uh, I always said it's like being on the twenty-seven Yankees or the eighty-five Bears. You know, one of those things that it's once in a lifetime, you know, uh, right place, right time. I'm always said I've been blessed. I thank God, but I made my own breaks too. And thank God they took them. But when they called your number, you, you know, you got to answer the bell, you know? So yeah. had I sucked, I couldn't do the role or saying this is fucked up. I can't kiss a guy or I can't be with a guy. I can't be thought of as a homo. And because I was in the restaurant business, working in New Orleans, which is very gay, working in Manhattan, which is very gay, the waiters, a lot of gays, I had no problem with it. I'm a live and let live kind of fucking guy. Right. Uh, I mean, I worked in an all gay restaurant when I was young. My friends were like, because they used to meet me after work. We used to go out. They go, I'm not fucking going in there. I go, what's the big fucking deal? Don't have to fucking, then I got to fucking grab your cock so you should fucking walk in. Take it easy. And, and the funny thing was that the waiters, there's this me and this kid Danny in the kitchen. I was straight in the chef. Everybody else was gay in the kitchen. They'd um, bring in the girls. They go, oh, this is Danny. This is Joe. They're straight. And we should tell them, keep bringing in the fucking girls. We want to meet the girls. Yeah, all right? Absolutely. And I, I, back then, I was 175. I was fucking working out. I was, you know, I'm a good-looking bastard. So, you know, it was fucking great. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah, we're, we're carousing around. It's still, it's stuff. still like that. I mean, in the service industry, and yeah. gay, gay guys seem to always have like twenty hot chicks with them. I don't know what the, what the deal make, is, but it's a tale as old, tale as old as time. But um, what, uh, gays around, um, uh, girls around gays. Yeah, yeah, just uh, all well, the gay people I know. They're usually rolling yeah. deep with lots of attractive girls. Well. They feel safe. They're not going to get hit on if they're hot. Uh, you know, they work with them in hair salons and fucking, you know, fashion and shows. So, you know, it goes hand in hand. 
So yeah. Yeah. I know we got a we have a couple minutes left here. Um so after recently, so during the height of COVID, I saw that you raised around thirty five grand on GoFundMe to buy food for restaurant get food from restaurants and make deliveries to frontline workers on Long Island and New York. So nursing homes, police departments, firefighters, postal workers. Uh, you were doing a lot of the del- deliveries yourself. Um, awesome cause for sure. I know things were especially crazy um, on the East Coast or in New York during COVID. Very everything was shut down for a very very long time. So I guess I, how did you? I, yeah. So I guess when it first hit, like March fifteenth, everything shut down. And I started, I think, April 7th, so three weeks later. And that's when everybody was, like, freaking out about it. No fucking... But I saw what was happening to restaurants and being a restaurant guy. I wanted to help the restaurants that were open. So I started GoFundMe to buy food from those restaurants in my neighborhood. And then take them to hospitals. And my sister-in-law worked in the delivery room and... She'd be like head to toe covered dealing with it and, uh, nursing homes and police department, post office, firemen and so on and so forth, cops. And I said, I'm going to help the restaurants and I'll help these people. And it wasn't like to send them pizza. It was like good food, you know, that it was really grateful. It was day, night, breakfast sometimes for the mailmen. Um, uh, yeah, so. I did that for like seven weeks and it was, uh, it was gratifying. I wasn't stuck in a house. I was actually doing something. I felt I was helping in some way. And, um, I was proud. I mean, I, you know, 35,000 is a lot of five, 10, 20s in there. You know what I mean? One guy, 5,000, uh, construction guy and it took off. Uh, and I was happy to do that. Definitely. Chris, I don't know if you know this about Joe, but. Uh, through my research, I found out Joe that you're a you're an avid collector of Santa Claus memorabilia. Is that, that true? Not, that, <laughs> no idea. No idea. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, do you have John John Costello Johnny Cakes? He gave me a a sander on a motorcycle, you know, leather jacket. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's one of my prized uh, fucking sanders. Yeah, I do collect. I don't collect as much. Pier one shut down. I used to get a lot of my stuff from there. I used to go crazy with fucking decorating my house. Inside, I still decorate. Outside, used to be like people would stop. I used to close the block. I used to do it for a charity. And, oh, nice. uh, yeah, I used to have dances and singers and it was a big thing. Roast uh, hot chocolate, hot dogs and I'd be Santa and I'd get, uh, people would donate toy. I'd give them to kids and it was pretty, it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so I collect Santas, and, uh, yeah, it's a big thing. You still dress up as Santa yearly, or is that... No, no, I just did it a couple of years, and then it got to be, uh, too much. Uh, but even the decorate, I don't even decorate now, is like I used to. Things break, it takes weeks, you gotta go guy get fucking people to help you, store in it, you know, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's big. I did, um, I also saw on Twitter the other day, you were recently were watching a Milwaukee Brewers baseball game and you noticed, uh, the Brewers biggest fan in the front row, that front row Amy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I saw that, front row for, Amy. <laughs> yeah, she's just known for show, going up, going to Brewers games and showing off her cleavage. So would you say she's a better mascot than Mr. Met? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, yeah, I knew she was probably keeping score, but then I said, man, maybe it's not. Maybe she's, uh, I don't know what the fuck. She could have been just writing shit down and maybe, uh, I mean, I saw it Score, the second night. Supposedly. What? Supposedly, yeah, she goes and keeps scores. She's been doing that for like 10, 10, 10 plus years. years. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, once I found out who she was and I started, you know, finding the images, she's fucking smoking. And yeah. what's the deal with her? She married or it's got to be, what, what's the deal with her? She, I think she, she is married, and she would just go solo to all the games. She had, a, like, one-season ticket, so I don't know if she's married to someone that had more money than her, but she's been doing this for, like, ten-plus years now. Uh, she's got a big her. fan. She's got a thing, uh, you know, baseball Annie. Um, uh, she's got a thing for baseball plays, but she's got a good seat, and uh, she's fucking smoking. I, I wish she would 
stand up and turn around. I just want to, but I saw it in the pictures. So yeah, she's hot. <laughs> you got to come to a Brewers game so you can see the other side. She's you'll, always there. She's a fan favorite. For mm. Sure. But um, so last question or last couple minutes. So post now you um you do you host private parties. Uh, you cook for how many people minimum usually when you're doing your private parties? I have a minimum of 16, but it's usually 20, 24. I do it up to 50. So it's, um, I started off with this girl I knew. Husband's a big fan. Can you mom come over and make a, you know, pasta dish or something? And it was like maybe six people and she flipped out and then she put pictures up on Facebook and she said, oh, my husband would love it. And it just fucking took off. So, um, I had like different menus they could choose from. And I have an assistant. Um, I have minimum 16 people. I'm there about 10 hours. Damn. I shop for the food. I cook. I do about 15, 18 appetizers. I do a shrimp scampi tasting. I do a choice of pasta. And then they have one of three entrees. And um, at some point, uh, I'm working now with a wine company, which is great. And I'll do some trivia. And if they get it, I'll sign bottles. Uh, of this wine, which by the way is wine still sold out. Yeah. Um, WTSO.com. What's that? I said the wine you've been working, so you're working with some pretty good, right. a pretty good wine vendor? Right. Well, I, if the, if the party needs wine, I said, listen, order from them. They got great deals on, you know, quality wines. And if you use my code, JoeVito81, you get a twenty dollars off for new customers over a hundred dollars, so that works out. And um, I'll you know I'll tell my story, I'll answer any questions that they have, and I take pictures of everyone. And it's a memorable thing, you know, a memorable thing. You know, it's for the husband, it's a big uh, you know fan, the father, the brother, the boyfriend, or friends just get together, they're fans. And the food is like you know, it's not bullshit food. It's real food. It's good food, and they're amazed because they're like, oh my god, it's so much and so good there's another course and another course and they have this woman that makes a soprano cake and it's pretty cool so it's different it beats going to a restaurant for two or three hours and you pay the same thing and then you've had a celebrity come and sit with you for an hour an hour and a half you know hey, i'm in the house with the guy for 10 hours sometimes it's a surprise they get him out i answer the door what the fuck you want here one time this guy was coming out out of the house, and I was walking up, and I carried this always in my car. You know, this is a little, you got to have this in case, you know, you went for a spot, and the guy fucking pulls right in, you know, it's a problem. And I go, oh, fuck, oh, you see me waiting here, you just grabbed the spot, what's up? So, I come out of the car, and he's coming out of the house, and I go, oh, fuck, oh, I told you not to make me come looking for you, right? Come here, you motherfucker. And he's going, who the fuck is this? And he started backing up, and the woman's going, Johnny, who the f- what's going on here? And he goes, I don't know. He's trying to get back in the house. And as I'm walking toward him, he goes, Vito? I go, yeah, motherfucker. It's me. It was pretty good, but it's fucking out. He didn't know who the fuck I was and what was going on. But uh, it was um, pretty funny. So it's a great fucking thing. It's pretty unique. I mean, you know, Sopranos, and then have like you know one of the major characters, and the food is fucking serious. It's it's a great thing, and yeah, I, I'm uh, the only one really doing thing. it. Yeah, true. I, I've got one question, and and I, we should have talked about this earlier. I think uh, I believe we're all at uh, Chris. You, Chris, you haven't had one question. This is like your tenth, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think we're all Italian. Do, do you know where you can trace your uh, your roots back to? Uh, I'm a, I'm Sicilian and Abruzzese. I noticed on the map one time there was a town, I think near Abruzzi called Ascoli. A-S-C-O-L-I, which is my last name, Ganascoli. Okay, sure. Right. Uh, and, um, actually when my great, great, great father, my grandfather came over, it was Ianascoli, and the I became a G. See. But the Scoli is definitely something to do with my name. So, I haven't really traced it all the way back, but um, I know, you know, I'm Sicilian and uh, Abruzzese. Hey, I'm, I'm Sicilian, too, so we got that. We got that going together. So, mm. good. We're, so what's, uh, on the, what's, what's on the agenda for the rest of the day for you, Joe? 
Well, it's 2.30 here, and I know the game started at 2 o'clock, and I know fucking the Yankees let off and Judge let off. If I miss that fucking homer, I'm going to be pissed because I forgot to tape it. I'm sure I'll see it a million times, but I would like to see it when it fucking happened. Yeah, I hear so, you. Say, yeah. no, say no more. Well, with that. <laughs> we, we, but we listen, it was, a, uh, time. it was a good time. I wish Christian good luck to you. Thank you. Uh, try to think outside the fucking box. Stick it in their ass before they stick it in yours. Absolutely. Don't be, yeah. And except if you got the opportunity to play gay on TV, accept it. Because you never take know. It. Don't pass it, it up. Say, but I would say if you're going to play gay, play a lesbian. True. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. It's 2022. <laughs> he could. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. And, you uh, Kyle, day. I don't know what the fuck you do. Uh, but, uh, whatever it is, good luck. And thanks for coming. We're prepared. You have a good rest of your day. Take care. All right, guys. Be well. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. See you.